Now, our subject today is the Reformation. And uh, you know approximately what we're talking about here, that is revolutionary uh, restructuring of the Latin church in the 16th century. But the terminology we apply to these changes is not all that clear. Uh, you know, exactly what should it be called? The, the Reformation, the 16th century Reformation, the 16th century Reformations, uh, and what about the Catholic Reformation? Is that some species of Reformation or is it a counter-Reformation? Uh, the terminology is actually sort of messy. And um, to look at you know, the terminology we use to look at reform uh, doesn't always make that clearer. Uh, that is, Christianity itself, in one sense, is always about reform. Uh, Jesus talked a lot about how people should repent, and in doing this, he's following a Hebrew Bible theme, uh, using words such as metanoia for repentance and change of heart, that's pretty central. Uh, when uh, the head of the twelve, Peter, gives a big address uh, soon after the execution of Christ, uh, Peter says, repent therefore and turn again so that your sins may be blotted out. Uh, when Paul writes to the Ephesians and talks about uh, put on the new man, uh, there is a level in Christianity where reform is pretty basic. Now if this is so, then how can we talk about the Reformation in the 16th century and take one little slice out of 2,000 years of history? Well, the distinctive uh, is the, the conviction that reform applied not only to individuals, that individuals should straighten up and uh, repent and turn again, but that reform had to be applied to the institutional church itself to the structured form of what was seen theologically as the whole body of Christ on earth. And the conviction was that the church needed to be a better salvation machine. It needed to get back to a vision of the early church. So that when we talk about Reformation, we're talking not just about individual reform, which is pretty central to Christianity, but we're talking about institutional restructuring. Now actually, even this is not a really great distinction for the Reformation, because there were many periods in Christian history where uh, a reform of the structure of the church back to earlier models uh, was a key social priority. Uh, in the Carolingian Renaissance, uh, Charlemagne, uh, wanted to get the Frankish church reorganized to conform better to early laws and to what we're seeing as uh, more biblical restructure. Uh, the so-called Gregorian reform, where popes and emperors are fighting out issues of church and state, uh, was often uh, described in terms of a return to the apostolic church. Uh, late medieval churchmen who uh, at the start of the Renaissance, we're recognizing that there were some real problems with the institution and structuring of the church. Uh, talked about the need for reform in head and members. So even this idea of institutional restructuring is not a complete distinctive of the 16th century. But I think there is a, an argument that in the 16th century, uh, people began to look upon the institutional church not just as imperfect, now, Christian theology, which suggests that human beings are fallen human beings, that Adam and Eve have screwed up and we've managed to keep screwing up ever since, uh, Christian theology uh, assumes that um, there's going to be a certain amount of imperfection in this dimension. Uh, but in the 16th century, there were people who saw the church not just as imperfect, but even as an obstacle uh, to the individual quest uh, for salvation. And at a certain point, actually a very precise point, Halloween of 1517, uh, there was suddenly a movement to try to make radical structural changes. Now, when we look at approximate points, you know, Martin Luther nailing 95 theses on the church door at Wittenberg, uh, we can some, sometimes think that approximate point is what the fight was about. But it's usually not. If you listen to the 
radio uh, this morning on the way over here, uh, you know that in Turkey right now, uh, Recep Erdogan is uh, using water cannons and tear gas trying to maintain uh, the credibility of his regime against all sorts of protesters in Istanbul. If you ask, well, how did that happen? Well, these are people who are fighting for a few rather scrubby trees in one Istanbul park. And that doesn't seem like, you know, in itself an issue sufficient to bring down the whole government or to cause the government to uh, quake and overreact. But oftentimes there are situations where there are accumulated grievances over a long period of time and even something sort of small and uh, uh, maybe not completely central or consequential uh, can cause big social changes. You know, in the Arab Spring recently, you had uh, a Tunisian fruit vendor who um, was hit up for corrupt uh, license fees and couldn't get them and burnt himself up and started chaos all over the Near East. Again, it's not that people are issued about are all that concerned directly about what kind of license fees fruit vendors have to pay, uh, but oftentimes there are accumulated grievances and suddenly some match sets it off. And when we look at the Reformation of the 16th century, we are looking at uh, all sorts of reaction that followed. Uh, Halloween of 1517, when Luther posted 95 theses on a church door. Now I'm going to talk mostly today about Martin Luther, uh, not because he was typical of all reformers or representative of all reforming thought. He had a lot of idiosyncrasies, but he was a catalyst that uh, set off uh, this whole uh, movement for the restructuring of the church, and uh, his story reveals a number of aspects of the, the grievances and of the concerns that are involved. Now, Luther was born in uh, 1482 or 1483. Actually, our post office had to decide one way or the other when they issued a Luther commemorative stamp, and I think they decided on 1483. So we're talking about uh, 10 years or so before Columbus sailed. Well, Luther uh, was his own idiosyncratic character in many respects. He was, in one way, representative of a lot of the new church reformers in his social origins. Now, when Luther talked to people, he claimed to be a peasant's son. And this is a lot like the way that um, uh, you'll find uh, good, shrewd Texans who describe themselves as just a little old country boy and then proceed to <laughs> insert the knife. Uh, and in fact, uh, uh, while Luther's grandfather uh, probably touched the plow at some point, uh, Luther's dad went into the mining business. And because of new advances in uh, pump technology and a growing economy where uh, precious metals and metals of other kinds were important, this mining business at the end of the 15th century was like the oil business in Texas in the 20th century. I mean, this was a, something you got into, something that could make you big money fast. And in fact, uh, Luther's dad had a half dozen mines, was on the city council of the town of Mansfield, and represented a kind of upwardly mobile uh, middle class. Uh, I, I mention this because if you look, it's not just Martin Luther, but John Calvin and other church reformers, a lot of them represented this group that we would see as the upper middle class. And there's probably some reason for that, in that the, the medieval church had developed its structure uh, centuries before. And in some ways, the medieval church looked a lot like society uh, of the early Middle Ages. So instead of having just uh, lords and peasants, uh, you had some bishops and wealthy abbots who sort of ran things. You had ordinary laymen who were catechized too, but didn't play a very active part. And this structure, you know, with a sort of active elite and um, uh, passive uh, mass of people supporting them, uh, was not only the early medieval social structure, but in some ways was a structure that was built into the medieval church. And uh, when you had developing a larger and larger class of people who were literate, who could read the Bible on their own, who had uh, a fair amount of money, who were interested in active participation in the church, uh, the medieval church didn't always find room for these people very quickly. And so it's uh, 
not by chance that we find a lot of these people active in the uh, more uh, radical uh, reform movements of the 16th century. And Luther, as a member of that class, his dad had great hopes for him to further improve the family. He was sent to the best prep school, to the best art school. He was sent to law school. The presumption uh, that um, Hans Luther had was that his son Martin would wind up as probably a, a lawyer or a counselor in the Holy Roman Empire and would further uh, raise the family fortunes. But where Luther was not typical, was that he had a high degree of religious sensibility. Uh, he was worried about himself, uh, worried about his salvation, worried about himself as a sinner. Uh, the supernatural was very present to Luther. Uh, you saw that in the readings in a review of Heiko Obermann's uh, biography of Luther, where uh, Luther allegedly had tossed an ink pot at the devil on the church wall. Well, you know, the devil was around for Luther. Luther the devil, Luther would be walking along, and the devil would suddenly appear on a fence post and moon him. Um, I mean, Luther, Luther had, uh, had a very strong consciousness that there is a spiritual world out there, and also a certain sense that uh, he himself uh, was a sinner and uh, might have properly trembled before God's justice. Well, Luther gets on all right, except uh, in law school, uh, first term, uh, he's gone home for semester break, he's going back, and he gets caught in a thunderstorm. And there's thunder and lightning bolts all around, and Luther uh, says a prayer uh, to St. Catherine, the patroness of minors, that if he ever gets out of this one, he will become a monk. And he does, to the considerable dismay of his father, who did not appreciate that career change. And as a monk, Luther joins the Augustinian Hermits, a uh, reformed, educated order. They aren't quite sure what to do with him. They recognize, on the one hand, that this is a very bright and intelligent young man. They recognize, on the other hand, that he's a bit troubled. And so what Luther's superiors decide is that what he should do is leave the security of the monastery and go off to university and get a doctorate in biblical theology. That this would occupy his mind, that he would read the word of God and maybe get some consolation about uh, God's protection of his people, that this would be a good solution. So Luther is sent back to the university. Now there's a certain irony here in that uh, Luther, after he has fights with church authorities, will spend a lot of time excoriating the medieval church for uh, neglecting the Bible, for abandoning the Bible, and going off and doing uh, scholastic disputations of various kinds. But in fact, the reason that Luther can make these critiques is because uh, Luther has been sent by the church to get the best education in biblical study and biblical criticism uh, that could be done. Now, when Luther graduates, uh, church authorities, and again, his, his monastic order is willing to do this, uh, send him off to the University of Wittenberg. Now, Wittenberg was a little university founded in Electoral Saxony uh, in 1502. Luther arrives there in 1508. Now, Wittenberg sounds impressive. I mean, White Mountain. But what it really is is a sort of uh, dreary sand dune. And if you've seen pictures of Texas Tech in the 1930s, where you have a wide open field and then the administration building, a little bit of the chemistry building, and everything else looks completely desolate, that's what Wittenberg was. And uh, Luther is sent there as a young professor. Again, he is still on a spiritual quest to find himself. And he does in his first series of lectures. Now he chooses to lecture for the year on the Book of Psalms, which is what you might expect a monk would choose because uh, monastic orders uh, basically prayed the whole Psalter every week. It was different Psalms for different occasions. This is something he would have known and thought about. He proceeds through the Psalter in order, Psalm by Psalm, verse by verse, uh, word by word, and comments. 
By the way, this is rather scary. We know what Luther did in this lecture because we have about two thirds of his notes, and we have about uh, the other third that can be reconstructed from student notes. And a lot of us have some trepidation about having our lectures known by student notes, but in any case, we can sort of put to, we can sort of put together what Luther was doing. And um, initially, uh, Luther's notes so show some. Uh, Disease. Uh, when he gets to the phrase the justice of God, uh, he actually uh, blots his page and spills ink all over it and uh, writes about six times, Lord have mercy on me. And uh, you can see that he doesn't much like the concept of the justice of God. In fact, he later on, talking about it, says, well, when I read about the justice of God, I hated God because uh, I had, what Luther envisioned was a Roman law style judge uh, with the accused guilty party brought before him and uh, throwing a book at that person for his guilt, which Luther thought he had abundantly. But later on, you get to spring semester about 40 psalms up and the phrase justice of God occurs again and uh, Luther doesn't mess up his page and he says, by this is meant to accept the salvation offered by Jesus Christ. And while Luther has various accounts about how he came to his insight back in 1509-1510, it seems pretty clear that the heart of it was that instead of reading justice of God as Roman law justice where people are judged for their sins and people were you know, created sinful and you know, so this seemed like a sort of a, a, a trap, uh, Luther reads justice as justification, as uh, being made just uh, through the merits of Jesus Christ. And this insight gives Luther uh, much more peace of mind. He'll always be a little bit eccentric, but he can see uh, that there is salvation in, in his theology. He can see salvation offered by Jesus Christ, and that uh, this gives the possibility that even a sinner uh, can be saved. Now, this is an insight by you know, a, an assistant professor theologian. And you wouldn't expect this to go very far. Uh, Luther is trying to work it out. Uh, his department chair uh, is a little concerned. And uh, Luther, who was pretty well read, said, ah, but it's in Augustine. That is, uh, the church father, Augustine of Hippo, back in the fifth century had at the end of his life had a big debate about grace and free will with uh, various antagonists. And it emphasized uh, the grace of God and the inability of human beings to do very much on their own. So that Luther's idea that salvation just comes from faith and not by works, uh, Luther said, well, we can find that in Augustine. And his department chair actually uh, took the department budget for the year and went down to Mainz where the complete works of Augustine had just been published this is the era of the printing press. And um, uh, the department went through it. And Luther made his case. So, OK, we can find a lot of what I'm working towards here in Augusta, and this is orthodox. And there were theology students who um, later on accused of being axe-wielding theology students. Luther's theology students were thought to be a little radical, at least by his opponents, uh, who were impressed uh, with the take that Luther uh, had on uh, key questions of grace. Now, all of this could have just sat around as a standard academic controversy, except that uh, next door to Electoral Saxon, where Luther worked, uh, there was an indulgence campaign. This is like a series of revivals or camp meetings. And uh, if you attend these things, there are prayers and so song and dance, and if you give money, for a good cause, in this case for the rebuilding of St. Peter, but also there was a cut for the Archbishop of Mainz who had some bills to pay. But if you gave money, if you did this good thing of giving money, then you were supposed to get spiritual benefit. Now this campaign didn't even go on in Electoral Saxony. The Luther's boss didn't allow it. Uh, but um, some Luther students apparently snuck over the border, and Luther heard about this and was appalled by the campaign. Part of it was because it was completely unorthodox in what the indulgent salesmen were claiming. 
That is, some of them were saying that this is a get out of jail, jail free card. I mean, you can uh, get this indulgence paper and they can go out and commit new sins and you're covered. Uh, There's a whole bunch of stuff that didn't work out according to any theological system. So Luther was concerned about that. But he was also concerned because of his theology, where he thought people get saved by faith and not by works, that even if this weren't a corrupt campaign, even if the promises made were carefully uh, couched in proper theological terms and there wasn't all this uh, razzmatazz, that still it would distract people because the real business of salvation is to accept the salvation offered by Christ and not to try to do good things like giving money to a good cause and get saved that way. So Luther wrote 95 Theses and nailed these uh, to the church door at Wittenberg. Now the church door is the university chapel. And this is not just an eccentric thing. I mean, if you went and nailed something on your church door, your pastor would probably not appreciate it. Uh, but in a university, uh, the announcement for debate was to nail uh, your proposed debate thesis on the church door. Actually, I had an old medieval Latin professor who uh, graduated from the University of Uppsala. And up into the 1950s, uh, they still nailed their doctoral dissertations uh, to a, a door of the university. And um, Bengt, who was a thorough Germanic scholar, said, and it took a very big hammer <laughs> you know, to be able to get a full dissertation on there. But uh, uh, what Luther is doing is actually a call for debate. 95 Theses, not about the reform of the church, but about this indulgence campaign. And Luther doesn't actually get his debate, but some of his students translate these Latin theses into German, and they get printed all over the place, and they cause all sorts of stir, and people stop buying the indulgences, the sales fall off, the indulgence campaign organizers are unhappy. Luther's boss, uh, Frederick the Wise, the founder of the University of Wittenberg, uh, appreciates that a, an assistant professor is getting all this attention, but is scared as to whether or not he's right. Uh, what Frederick does is he writes Erasmus, the senior northern humanist, and says, well, you know, is, is Brother Martin right? And Erasmus writes back, yes, but he lacks gentleness, <laughs> which is actually a pretty good description of Luther's character. And uh, Luther winds up getting involved in debates well, uh, the indulgence controversy, which you know, was one sort of side part of Luther's theology, had um, come up just because there was an indulgence campaign nearby. It did get attention, and got attention all the way down to Rome, where amazingly, because Rome moves very slowly, within about a year and a month, you know, in November of 1518, there's a papal bull that agrees with Luther on about two-thirds of Luther's charges, because a lot of what Luther was attacking uh, was real abuses in this campaign, and Rome was willing to back down on that. But in talking about this, uh, Luther recognized that popes had okay some aspects of this indulgence campaign. Luther did not like even the principle of the campaign, not just the corrupt things. And so even when he gets this bull back from Rome that vindicates him in large part, he says, well, it doesn't cite the Bible enough. You know, Luther's not impressed, and he gets involved in debates over papal power, because popes had endorsed this. He gets involved in debates over the sacraments, because people attending the sacraments might be trying to save themselves by works. Uh, when he discovers that not everyone is convinced by what he, Luther, sees as pretty convincing arguments, he does something that you read about in the packet. That is, he writes an open letter to the Christian nobility, uh, telling the emperor and the nobles that if the churchmen aren't going to reform themselves according to Luther's principles, that um, the state should do it for them. That, that is, that uh, just as princes have the responsibility to keep order and to reduce violence, so they have the responsibility to protect the faith, and they should probably take over their churches and reform them according to the principles that Luther sees as important. Well, Luther rather quickly gets himself excommunicated in uh, 1520. Uh, he doesn't know how to react to this. Uh, he threatens to burn the code of canon law and to make a big fuss and be a rebel. But instead, uh, Frederick the Wise enables him to get a free pass to go uh, to the, the imperial 
council meeting, the diet that was being held at the town of Worms, uh, where Luther would make a legal case that, uh, in fact, his condemnation by Rome uh, was not properly attained by legal means, that he hadn't had a direct hearing on it, and therefore it should be held in suspension. And this is pretty key, because if he is excommunicated from the church, uh, he could be picked up as a heretic by various kinds of civil authorities. Now, his boss doesn't seem to be about to do it, but he's in real danger here with an ecclesiastical condemnation. So uh, Luther goes to Worms. He wants to present his views to the emperor and doesn't get much of a chance. They bring a big stack of books because Luther's ideas have spread through the printing press. They've gone viral in much the same way that uh, today some revolts have gone viral with people who have uh, text messaging and tweet and so forth. The printing press was the 16th century equivalent of that. And Luther usually had a half dozen presses at work on various kinds of pamphlets and sermons. So there was a big stack of stuff. But uh, and Luther was just asked, did you write this? So he didn't really have a chance to defend it. He asked for some time to think about it because he didn't want to defend everything he wrote. His thoughts had been evolving. Uh, but he finally uh, came back the next day and said, look, you know, I, I wrote this stuff. If um, you can show by scripture that I'm wrong, I'm happy to retract. Otherwise, here I stand. And the emperor, who's a young kid of about 20, the emperor says, well, look, it's obviously you're sincere here, but I'm emperor. Uh, my job is to protect the faith of the people. Uh, who do I believe here? One friar or um, uh, the testimony of a thousand years of ecclesiastical tradition? And so the emperor uh, rather quickly lets the excommunication stand. Stand Luther then goes home and presumably when he would get back to Wittenberg, he could be subject to arrest, except he doesn't get there. As he's riding home, suddenly robbers come down and hit his party and uh, Brother Martin disappears. Now it turns out later on that what actually happened was that Frederick the Wise, his boss, had come to his rescue and grabbed him and stuck him in a castle at Wartburg uh, in the northern part of his principality. Luther uh, grew a beard and became Squire George and disappeared for a while and spent his time uh, translating. Uh, the New Testament into German. Uh, translation will become in some ways the basis of uh, the modern German language, a huge uh, monument to, in Germanic style and grammar and so forth. Uh, it's interesting though, when we look at Luther's German translation, while Luther's always associated with sola scriptura, with scripture alone as the source of um, what to believe, Luther's New Testament actually has introductions to each book. And uh, Luther is evaluating the Bible on the basis of Luther's central theological insight. So Paul's letter to the Romans, which talks a lot about grace, Luther says in his introduction, this thing has everything uh, necessary uh, to salvation. On the other hand, when he gets to the epistle of James, which talks a lot about faith and works, now Luther is not so happy. And Luther says, well, look, uh, in the manger, there was the baby Jesus, and there was straw. And this is a really strawy epistle. And why it's in the New Testament, God only knows. <laughs> Luther, is, Luther is willing to champion his particular theological insight. Now, uh, meanwhile, back at Wittenberg, the axe-wielding theology students are still there. And they're still making changes, closing down monasteries, stopping masses for the dead, trying to reorganize the liturgy and to move away from Latin and into German. And there's a lot of disorder and confusion, and uh, the few people who know where Luther is uh, keep writing him and asking him for advice and information. Eventually, when the changes have gone far enough, in Electoral Saxony and elsewhere, uh, Luther is allowed to come home and um, be Professor Martin Luther. Where, which he will be for the next 20 or so years until his death. In fact, when Luther is um, painted by Hans Holbein, uh, and Luther has to choose how to present himself, uh, he presents himself in his doctoral robes, that is his university uh, gown with the three, three stripes on the sleeve that you see us wear at graduation. He, identifies himself as Professor Martin Luther. What he's doing is not running a Lutheran church, uh, but giving advice 
uh, to princes, to pastoral care committees, uh, to Lutheran bishops, to people who want to put things together. Uh, there are challenges as to how far his, once he has broken with the authority of the medieval church, oftentimes revolutions start out with a moderate break and then get more and more radical. There are uh, plenty of people who want to go further. Uh, nobles who want to attack the prince bishops and take their property. Uh, peasants who want to revolt uh, for their rights, but who will ask for a couple of Lutheran ideas, you know, the ability to approve their pastors, for example. And uh, all of these people think Luther should back him, but he does not. He's actually very conservative politically. He thinks that people should obey their masters. Uh, he backs the German princes in their reformation. Now, there are also uh, people who want to go farther, not just in terms of social changes, but in terms of religious changes, particularly uh, radicals who get lumped together under the name of Anabaptists. An Anabaptist is not a name that these biblical literalists would have chosen. It's a name given them by their opponents for an odd reason. Uh, that is, uh, the underlying law code of Europe was Roman law, law as codified by Justinian and taught in the European law schools. And in Germany, uh, princes could appeal to Roman law as a basis of authority. And because of something that had happened way back in the 6th century, Justinian's laws included a prohibition against baptizing anyone twice. Now, uh, because these biblical liberalists had some problems with infant baptism and rebaptized people again, that part of their belief got them involved uh, with a violation of Roman law so that uh, their opponents are happy to call them uh, rebaptizers or denials or deniers of baptism uh, to give them this Anabaptist label. But what they basically wanted was even more biblical literalism than uh, Luther thought was necessary. Uh, one debate, for example, that Luther had with some of these people involved how you celebrate the Lord's Supper. Because since the 13th century in the medieval church, uh, when the ministers had said the consecration words over the bread and wine, uh, bells were rung and the bread and the chalice were held up so the whole congregation could see. Now, as Luther is trying to revive the Lutheran services, the question is, do you continue to do this? Now, the Anabaptists say, certainly not, because uh, we find the Lord's Supper first described as a Passover meal, and when people eat, they don't wave their food around. All right, this was clearly not biblical, and so you don't do it. Uh, Luther says, well, okay, it's probably not what Christ did, but does it help people? Can they see what's going on? Does it do any harm? Does it contribute to the faith? Similarly with bishops, Anabaptists say that, well, the word episcopos only shows up several times in scripture, and it's not described in the way that medieval bishops are described. Uh, we shouldn't have bishops in the church. Luther says, well, bishops aren't uh, necessarily to be distinguished from the whole priesthood of believers on the basis of some sacramental character, but in fact, you've got an organization and it has officers and there are different people who do different things, and if German princes want to have bishops as part of their Lutheran churches, that's fine. And of course, baptism, as you can guess from the name Anabaptist, becomes a big issue. Uh, Luther says that baptism is a witness of faith, but infants can't have faith. Uh, yet, they have it potentially because their parents and godparents will teach it to them, but when an infant is baptized, the infant can't necessarily comprehend the, the right that's going on. So Anabaptists say, well, in New Testament, we don't find any clear instance of the baptism of an infant. Uh, Peter and Paul do baptize whole households, but they don't say, you know, where they start and stop. Uh, and therefore, you know, it shouldn't be done. So Luther is quickly faced by people who want to go a lot farther. And some of these Anabaptists, uh, one of the things Catholics and Lutherans and Calvinists can agree on is they don't like Anabaptists. <laughs> they don't like people whose more radical reformation will cut through bonds of social order. You'll also have other reforms through John Calvin. What Calvin does, he's a Frenchman who takes refuge in the city of Geneva, right on the edge of uh, France. He takes reform ideas that Luther and others have developed and moves them out of the German cycle. Because Luther 
was great at speaking to Germans, as you saw from uh, A Mighty Fortress is Our God or from his broadside propaganda, you know, these uh, strange revolutionary cartoons printed just on one side of a sheet of paper so that it's possible for uh, peasants who might not be literate to hang these strange images, say the papal monster, you know, right on their walls. Uh, Luther spoke to Germans, but that didn't necessarily speak to other peoples of Europe. And Calvin, who could write in Latin, and who could write a more systematic portrayal of what a Reformed church should look like, uh, was able to spread Reformed churches to the Dutch Low Countries, to Scotland, uh, to a minority uh, French church. Uh, now, Calvin has one variation on magisterial reform. That is, Lutheran reform is reformed by the magistrates, by kings and princes, top down. Uh, Calvin probably wouldn't have minded this, except that he couldn't get the French king to agree. And so Geneva had to be organized more as an independent um, city-state uh, with an independent church without an Episcopal structure. Much of the 16th century reform is magisterial. It's the king of England declaring himself to be the supreme head of the English church. If it's kings of Scandinavia or German princes making themselves the heads of reformed churches in their own territories, uh, this tends to be a top-down affair. Only the Anabaptists, so they're more radical uh, religious reformers who get persecuted by just about everybody, uh, only the Anabaptists uh, really wind up um, trying to separate out uh, church from state. And even they might not have minded a kind of theocracy, except they couldn't, uh, at months in other places, get away with it. Catholics, too, faced by these challenges, were involved in their own reforms, and for some of the same reasons. That is, there were perceptions that aspects of the medieval church weren't working right. There were Catholic kings who wanted more direct control over their churches and not to subsidize some ecclesiastic out in Italy. Uh, but um, Catholic reform, while we used to characterize it as counter-reformation, you know, sort of a response to Protestantism, which much of it is, uh, was also uh, something that began a generation before. That is, if we look at Spain and at the revival of a kind of new scholasticism and at the, uh, the Bible translation project at Salamanca, a lot of the same things that uh, produced reform in areas that became Protestant uh, are going on in the Catholic areas. And the Catholic areas get the advantage of holding a council. In the old days, the way that you solved theological differences was to bring all the bishops together. That was harder for Protestant reformers to do because they uh, tended to represent churches that were organized as principalities or as nations, whereas the medieval church headquartered at Rome still claimed to be an international body and assembled the Council of Trent from 1546 to uh, 1563, uh, and uh, tried to clean up a lot of the corruption. There was a debate as to whether you should change doctrine to meet some of these Protestant ideas, or whether you should reaffirm the doctrine of the medieval church, which is what generally ran up, was won out. Uh, but on the other hand, uh, worked to have a better educated clergy, uh, worked to eliminate abuses in various ways. Now, all of these sides uh, did not want to have lots of churches even though they might want their churches more organized uh, on a local level. But the vision was that there was one church uh, founded by Jesus Christ, and the question was to reform it so that it better fit uh, apostolic principles. By about the 1560s, it's clear that this is not working out. You know, it's interesting when the Council of Trent has four sessions, the first two have Protestant observers. People are hoping that there'll be a settlement reached that everyone will be happy with. The last two don't. And this is becoming a very messy divorce. You know, when you have a divorce uh, where people don't agree, you divide up the furniture, you divide up the pets. Uh, some things now protesting churches won't do because they're too papist. Uh, some things that Catholics don't want to do because they're too Protestant. Uh, you have lines being drawn in religious terms. Now, uh, the sides want to convince each other, but they aren't managing to do that. One possibility, in theory, might be a military solution. 
That is, maybe one side could win the other, but beat the other militarily. The difficulty is that this doesn't fit well with Christian theology. That is, you can't convert people by force. If salvation is accepting the, the grace offered by God freely, uh, you can't stick a sword in someone's chest and make them do it. So, uh, theologically, this is very difficult. The medieval church does have a kind of a small way of trying to um, justify force, which is to say that maybe force could level the playing field. That is, let's say that an Augustine of Hippo actually was faced with this when the Roman Empire went after heretics. Uh, you can't convert people by force, but if there are villages where you can't send a preacher in because the preacher is going to get roughed up and kicked out, if you send in troops so that you can preach, then that's just leveling the playing field. And um, in the New World, where conquistadors might conquer territory so that uh, friars could come along and preach to people, this sort of one-two punch was thought to be justified in certain areas. But still, there are real limits to what you can do militarily. On the other hand, the people who do want wars of religion are the new nation states. Not wars of religion, but wars in general, because they've got new military technology, they have scores to settle, there's a whole new world to fight about and divide who gets what. And so there are wars that naturally take place. And people who fight wars want to justify wars in terms of God is on our side. Uh, this is always true. Medieval armies have chaplains and have sermons before battle. Uh, Reformation armies will have the same. And so the wars from 1550 to 1650 are called wars of religion. But in fact, uh, these aren't much different from the Hundred Years' War before or from the wars that Louis XIV fights afterwards. I mean, they're nation states with their own Machiavellian political agendas. But because people are concerned about these religious debates, they're very quick to try to cast uh, the military efforts in terms of a battle for true religion. And I'm about out of time here, but I want to note that in some ways the issue here is about the same as with the Cold War in the 20th century. That is, you do have atheistic communism versus uh, America, one nation under God. Uh, but in fact, there are issues of control of Europe that Russia and the United States would fight over anyway. But uh, each side is happy to get religious justifications to get people enthused about the struggle. And that's what we're dealing with in the early modern period, so it's not always easy to tell if these so-called Reformation conflicts are really wars of religion. They're wars that have religion invoked, but are they caused by religion? Well, in most cases, no. Okay, that's a very quick and dirty view of um, Reformation issues. Uh, we've got some time here for questions, and then uh, after a break, uh, there'll be time to discuss some of these issues in individual groups. Now, Ms. G uh, how, how does this work? You have a microphone and you'll take questions, right? Ms. Galley here will. At, uh, I think on one of the handouts you had, you had some questions on there. And the, <clears throat> the bottom one was, was the overall result of the Reformation of the 16th century a more Christian Europe? Or if you could uh, address that, please. Well, I think I will let you all address that in discussion tables, but let me use the occasion of your good question to note that um, I'm a historian, and there are different ways to answer this. That, and one would be theological. That is, if you had a, a theological definition of what constituted true Christianity, you might be able to measure uh, the different peoples and states of Europe against that theological definition. Well, that doesn't work so well for history. Uh, theology is deductive. Theology starts with um, uh, grounding myths or reveals scripture and then can deduce down. Theology actually can do things historians cannot do. Theology can make absolute statements. If the first principles are right and you work deductively, uh, you can make some thou shalt's and thou shalt nots that actually make good logical sense. Historians just make more humble probability statements. We look at the evidence uh, that events have left behind, which is always too fragmentary to do anything. Past events are lost and can't be recreated in the laboratory. But if there are certain things that um, seem to be 
associated with uh, followers of Christ. I don't know how you'd want to define that, if it's um, participating in church services, if it's um, uh, being on the right membership rolls, if it's um, reading the Bible or whatever. If there were things that you might say were associated with Christianity, then one would answer that question by saying, well, are these things uh, more in evidence in, say, 1600 than they were in 1500? And that would be the basis of trying to answer that question. But I'll let you all work that out in discussion. 